This is the Home Tech Podcast for Friday, April 16th, I think. Nothing like adjusting your audio chain at the very, like, la- literally nine seconds. Trying to figure out, oh, I'm not recording, but now I am. Welcome to the Home Tech Podcast, a podcast about all aspects of home technology and home automation. Uh, this week, we've got a couple of uh, couple of headlines and uh, some news from, from Roku. We've got some new gear out, which is kind of cool, and a new OS, OS Roku OS X. They didn't call it OS X. I don't know what's going on there, but... First, as I do every week, I want to remind everyone uh, about the Home Tech Talks that we have going on. Last week, we had a really good one uh, that we did on the Unify Master's class. Um, I don't think I published that up, so I, I need to get back over there and upload that over to the Patreon page to make sure everybody has access to that. Uh, for some reason, I'm, I think I forgot to do that, but um, it was actually really good. Uh, we had a really good discussion about all things Unify um, and and mostly centered around like how to set up the the wireless access points and that kind of thing, uh, just kind of tips and tricks and, and things that we learned along the way. And we actually learned some new stuff, uh, which is actually the pick of the week this week. So um, don't forget to check that out. This week, we, we've got to move from, I, I accidentally scheduled a training for some reason at work. So I won't be able to do it Thursday. We're going to move it to Friday, same time, same bat channel, that kind of thing. Um, and we're going to talk about dashboards, which I think would be kind of cool. I, I'm, I'm dashboard curious and I... I've never seen a dashboard that I've liked too much, and I don't know, I, I'm, I think I'm missing something when it comes to dashboards and how to set them up. Um, I do like the home home kit, the, the home app dashboard, and I guess just because it's so simple and doesn't really offer that much, much customization. But when I get into like the other dashboard programs, even some of the other home kit apps that offer dashboard features, I get a little overwhelmed and, and tend to, to not do too much with those. So... Um, with that said, oh, I, I do have um, some announcements to make this week. Uh, we had a couple of new patrons come on at the five dollar level, so I get some big shout out on the show here. And uh, uh, new patron TJ, well, actually new old patron TJ, but um, TJ TJ uh, goes way back. TJ and I go way back. We, we've uh, he used he was one of the first patrons of the sh- on the show. Uh, moved away from Florida. He was here in Florida, I think, and he moved away. And I hadn't heard from him in a long time. Glad to have him back. He jumped jumped in the hub and was having some good conversations in there. And then a new patron, Russ Shank. Uh, thanks, thanks, guys, both. Thank you both uh, for helping out with the show and uh, bell, being, ringing the bell. There we go. Um, and 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 helping the show out. Uh, totally appreciate that for supporting the show, uh, both long term and short term. I, I, Russ is, is just joining us, but TJ's been around for a while. Both are in the hub now, uh, so and both have access to those those uh, home home tech. Uh, talks right there. So be sure to take advantage of those guys. And with that, let's jump into some home tech headlines. Well, it's no surprise to anybody who's been listening to the show for the past two weeks here, but news, uh, the news officially came down that uh, Logitech has now discontinued a uh, line of Harmony Universal remotes. Uh, then it's over. End, the end of the line, end of an era, I guess. Uh, in a post on its support site, Logitech said that its remaining stock of Harmony remotes will continue to be available through retail channels until stocks run out, which by some accounts they already have, and that will con- it will continue to support the remote for the foreseeable future. And here's a quote, we plan to support our Harmony community and new Harmony customers, which includes access to our software and apps to set up and manage your remotes. We also plan to continue to update the platform and add devices to our Harmony database. Customer and warranty support will continue to be offered. So it's almost like they're not shutting down, but they're just not making the hardware anymore. I don't know. It seems like Logitech has a has a history of this. And I, I, I want you to kind of think back way back into like 2000, like maybe 2006, 2007, somewhere in there. There was this company, it may have been before that, this company that was made this little thing called uh, Slim 3. Or, I don't remember. It's like a, a strange name to it. Um they were bought by Logitech and Logitech made the squeeze box or maybe the squeeze box came first. I don't remember the squeeze box. Logitech had this little streaming box called the squeeze box around and you could set this thing up and it could stream from, from services like Pandora, uh, Rhapsody, uh, maybe like a few radio services. And, and I mean, it was an okay, like an okay product. People, there was a lot of people that liked it. Um, I think there was some, the, they had the ability to like customize the software a little bit. Um, I know that it was kind of like forked out a little bit later or 
development kind of kept going on it because I know of there was there was a lot of companies that were still using the squeeze box like APIs and technologies to be able to utilize like audio streaming audio in their own products. And if you go to mysqueezebox.com, it's still up and running and it's got ancient Logitech branding and a broken like TLS certificate, but it's still running. And that's like saying something because they shut down way back in 2012. So almost 10 years later, that thing's still up and going. I mean, it is, but it isn't. You can't really have broken certificates on the internet these days and expect stuff to work, but there it is. If you, if you go want to go look at a piece of history that is still up and running, mysqueezebox.com. I don't know. Hey, hey, Logitech, there, there's been like, I, I, even my speculation that somebody could come along and buy this. And I don't know, like Logitech could probably make more money licensing its control database than they did making the Harmony remote. So maybe that's something that they're going to do. It says they're still going to add de- device support and, and kind of keep the development up. And I, I you know, that's kind of my day job. If, if you've got the right developers and people that know the, the, the software inside and out and you're paying them, I mean, it's, it's not hard to do. And once they do it once, they really don't, they, it's not like they have to program a million Harmony remotes that are out there. They just have to do it once. And if somebody has that TV, the new TCL TV that comes out and they want to have those good IR codes, um, they can learn those in and, and, and put them into their, their database. And I, I, you know, I think they could probably license that database off too, right? I have a feeling that's what what they do. Um, I don't know. Whatever happens, it seems to be the end of the universal remote. Uh, there's no no other consumer choices available, and uh, you know it, it, it's kind of uh, the end of the saga <laughs> of, of harmony. Uh, unless something happens in the near future, I don't know. This story's lasted us three weeks here on the show, so <laughs> it, it's not so bad. But uh, you know, the march towards input zero continues at a rapid pace, and there'll probably be more on that as we uh, we talk about some of the new technology, the new t- new stuff out from Roku. Rumors out of, from Samsung, according to a report from the Korean broadcaster MTN, Samsung may start producing OLED TVs. I have to be careful here because they use usually do QLED, right? Um, and the panels are going to be sourced by rival LG. The two, company, the two companies reportedly inked a deal for Samsung to buy up to 1 million OLED panels from LG in the second half of 2021, with up to 4 million panels in 2022. And Samsung is uh, famously stuck with its QLED technology for high-end TVs, and though it's, though it's still one of the, the biggest manufacturers for OLED displays for smartphones, um, they've stuck with the LED technology on their, t- their flat panels. And so meanwhile, LG is committed to OLED and uh, they're, they're doubling, tripling down. They, they want to be the number one OLED uh, brand out there for flat panels. Uh, and they've committed OLED for their expensive, you know, their high-end TVs. Uh, and also they supply for Sony and a few other manufacturers for their OLED panels. So not, not only will LG be supplying LG TVs, OLEDs, they'll be supplying Sony, they'll be supplying uh, Samsung now and you know, a couple other uh, smaller manufacturers out there. Um, so big, big changes coming to the the smart <laughs> the flat panel business. It seems like this comes and goes in cycles. You know, I I, I can remember years ago uh, install or, uh, working at Circuit City and seeing that Panasonic. Uh, well, it was probably like twenty two, twenty three thousand, twenty four thousand dollars for like a fifty inch plasma showing up in the in the system, and we all kind of like stood around the uh, stood around the terminal looking at you know how much commission you could make on that if you sold it, but. Uh, yeah, that's, that was, that would seem like it was yesterday. And of course, plasmas are out, LCDs are in, LCDs are out, OLEDs in or QLED. And now I don't know, it's, it, it, who knows what's next? Um, uh, seems like OLED's got some legs to it, especially since Samsung's switching to it. But, uh, I was kind of reading this article we'll put in here from Engadget it says, uh, some of this actually makes sense because everyone's shifting away from LCD technology on their high end models and the LCD supply chain is already like, uh, driven by a few Chinese companies and they listed them out. I've never heard of them. They're like three, two, three character initials. Uh, I've never even heard of these companies like TCL, um, but not TCL. It's other companies. Um, and it's rumored that Samsung was actually producing a hybrid QD OLED screen and they had some production issues with that. Um, so they were actually may have been forced to order some stuff from LG. Don't know. They could also like use OLED as a stopgap for the, until their micro LED technology comes in. So like we've, we've been seeing them uh, come out with those products for a while now and kind of the larger format TVs. 
and it, I think maybe as soon as that that technology works its way down uh, in price and in production, uh, they may be able to, to wedge micro LED into more consumer driven panels. But it looks like for the next couple of years here, we're all going to be relying on LG for their production for the higher end TVs. It looks like everything's going OLED for the next couple of years. Some news from Netflix here and, and Sony. Netflix will get exclusive streaming rights to all of Sony's upcoming movies. The two companies announced a new agreement that gives the streaming giant exclusive rights to Sony's upcoming theatrical releases beginning in 2022. And according to The Hollywood Reporter, the five-year agreement will start will pay Sony about $1 billion. I bring up the pinky for that. Um, the deal... Uh, new uh, uh, with the deal, new Sony movies will go exclusively to Netflix uh, following their theatrical release. So, kind of a, a pattern that we've seen uh, in the past. The deal covers uh, blockbuster releases like Morbius, Uncharted, and uh, as well as um, the new Spider Verse sequels and a couple of other uh, Spider Man type movies that are coming out. Uh, that that big blockbusters for Sony, big big movies. Um, so, great deal for Netflix uh, to get, to keep people on their platform. It also includes uh, some older films from Sony's catalog, but they didn't actually outline what those were. And uh, Net- Netflix will actually get first pass at Sony's direct-to-streaming titles, which Sony has already said that the, they're going to, to have a number of those in, in the pipeline. So, good, for, like I said, good for Netflix to keep people in in the uh, in their in their in in house and, and watching. I know if there's a Spider Verse, uh, I'll probably go see the Spider Verse movie actually in the theater uh, now that we can we can actually start getting out. In, in, in two weeks, I can actually go out and into public, uh, public, and and uh, you know not worry too much. I, I had my second shot on Monday, woohoo! So, uh, yeah, hopefully you can back get back to a theater. And uh, we've got a couple of dinner theaters around here that it, they've been open for a little while uh, at half capacity. So um, maybe we'll start partaking in those a little bit more. Uh, but good, for, good for Netflix uh, and good for Sony uh, for making inking these deals and getting a billion dollars. <laughs> All right. So uh, big news today, uh, I, this week actually, uh, Roku has introduced a trio of new devices uh, this weekend, a new OS. And uh, first, first we'll talk about. All right, there's there's three three new three new hardware pieces that we want to talk about. Uh, first is a new thirty nine ninety nine dollar thirty nine thirty nine dollar forty dollar Express four K plus streaming device. And ships in mid May. The Express four K plus replaces the Roku Premiere pretty much. As the company's entry-level 4K player it has a faster processor, dual dual band Wi-Fi, and increased internal storage, and uh, plus the Roku says now that you can attach a micro USB Ethernet adapter if you prefer a hardwired connection, which is probably a good idea. Uh, well, you know, unless you can't. Uh, the Express 4K is also the first Roku player to support HDR10+, which will come to the Roku, Roku Ultra as well after a future firmware update in that OS 10. A stripped down 4K Express player will be exclu- exclusively sold to Walmart for $5 less, 35 bucks. Uh, this model will also make its way to Canada, Mexico, and the UK. The only real difference is that it ships with a basic remote rather than the voice remote that comes with the Plus. And the voice remote's actually something that they came out with as well. Um, they've had this for a while, but the big news on this one was Apple <laughs> has worked out a deal with Roku. Um, that'll give the streaming video service its own shortcut button on the Roku Voice Remote Pro. Uh, and this is the first time the branded Apple TV Plus button has appeared on any remote control, uh, other than, you know, the custom remotes, I guess. The custom, you know, like the Neo remote. I know you could do that there. Uh, the, the remote, uh, which features a rechargeable battery, a headphone jack for private listening, and two pro- programmable shortcut buttons, uh, and the usual branded buttons like Netflix, Disney Plus, Hulu, and now Apple TV Plus. I, I did like the seeing that they had a rechargeable battery. I, don't, I think that's a new feature on this one too. Uh, so it's kind of nice that you can recharge it rather than uh, swapping out like some triple A's or something like that. The third uh, last thing that they came out with was a, um, uh, a sound bar. They're calling a uh, stream bar pro. They've had a stream bar out before they called the Roku smart sound bar. And uh, this one is refreshed. It now includes the Roku voice remote that we talked about uh, and a new virtual surround feature. And this one prices in at one seventy nine, one hundred and eighty dollars. Uh, the stream bar stream bar pro will also be available to order from Roku's website in May, late May, and should start arri- arriving at major retailers in June. And I, I they said the virtual surround. Uh, well, we'll get to that here. The virtual surround is also coming to the smart soundbar 
with the software update as well. So I don't really, I'm like squinting at these. I'm trying to figure out what the difference is between between these two things, these two products. And really, maybe it's the price. I don't know. It just doesn't seem like there's much difference. But they, Roku also announced latest software, Roku OS 10, which began rolling out and, and start making its way to all supported device, devices in the coming weeks. They got a couple of new feature, features here. Instant resume. And so this is this is an interesting feature. Uh, now streaming apps, what they'll do is they'll pick up right where you left off uh, when you at, la, last exited. So if you're watching something, uh, you exit the app, you come back a couple of days later, you pick back up, boom, you, you start back kind of like you'd expect to rather than having to go, go back through all the menus and work your way through. Uh, they noted that this seems to require some additional work on developers uh, part, like to get, because it only works with a few apps, like the Roku channel is offering it, but um, none of the big players like Netflix or Prime Video are supporting anything like that yet. Um, so we'll have to see how that plays out. It sounds like a neat feature, though. It sounds like a, like a smart caching idea, like it downloads the movie and it's just sitting there ready to go when you get back into the app. Seems seems, seems nice. Um, automatic Wi-Fi detection. Now, this is actually a really cool feature. And um, I'm not sure, I mean, if Apple did anything like this, maybe, but uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure. It, this this is, this basically, when you're setting up the Roku device, it, it it, it it looks at the Wi-Fi options in your house. And if you've got two networks that are running like 2.4 and a, and a 5G network, um, Roku will recommend which one's the better option. And you may think, well, the 5G is always got to be the option. And it's, it's not, actually. So if you've got the 5G router on the other side of the house, sometimes you can have slower speeds because 5G doesn't penetrate through walls and the signal doesn't go very far, as opposed to 2.4 which can punch through walls, uh, you get slower speeds, yes. But at, at the end of the day, you really don't need the full, you know, 600 megabits a second or whatever it is uh, from uh, from 5G that you're, you're getting from 2.4. So like, you just need a little bit of that bandwidth, but it's got to be a good, solid piece of bandwidth. You can't, it can't be sporadic in and out like the 5G band is if it's weak. So um, also as part of this smart automatic Wi-Fi detection that they're offering, if there's any buffering or stream interruptions, it, the device itself may pop up and say, hey, why don't you jump over to the other network and, and get a better signal and, and be able to watch and watch the show that you're trying to watch. Um, so I think this is really smart. A, a lot of people set these up, want to get on the 5G network or, you know, they're just setting it up. They don't know that they're setting it up on a 5G network. And it may not have the best signal. And so this is uh, really smart on Roku's part to kind of like eliminate that confusion from from the end user and uh, just kind of like push it as an option. Like if you if you want to, you know, want to connect to it later, if it, it may work out better if you if you need to use 2.4 or say say it sees that your 5G signal is better. Maybe it wants to switch to that. Uh, maybe it'll switch over to that. So um, automatic games console configuration. So here here's um, more of the death to the harmony type thing. Um, starting with Roku OS 10, when you plug in a console into Roku TV, a tile will change to the right name and the Roku TV will enter game mode. So depending on the Roku TV model used, the settings will get automatically configured and may include like HDR gaming, auto low latency mode, variable refresh rate, high frame rate, and THX certified game mode. All that may get turned on by plugging in the console. That's... That's smart. That's automation right there. So uh, it's all built right into the Roku TV and part of their software package. Great. Um, AirPlay 2 and HomeKit support will be extended to more devices. So I think they were on whatever the previous devices are. Uh, now it's going to go on HD Roku uh, streaming devices as well as the Roku Express and uh, select HD Roku TV models. Uh, and then another couple of options here that you get to customize the TV channel guide for OTA. So if you've got an antenna, you can go in and customize that, that guide a little bit and maybe delete a few channels that you don't want to watch. Uh, HDR10 Plus for Roku, Roku Ultra and the new Roku 4K Plus, Express 4K Plus. And it also adds virtual surround, as we talked about, for the Roku Smart Surround Bar and the Stream Bar Pro. So a bunch of, bunch of stuff from Roku. Um, I am really excited to see them kind of moving stuff along. Uh, it, it's, it's not often that like you get so many like <laughs> new things out of one company in one week. It's been quiet for a while and, you know, Roku comes along and drops, you know, quite a, quite a few things. I, I, I noticed it from, from the remote story that came along, uh, and then started digging deeper and it's like, Roku, Roku's really knocked it out of the park. I, I think this is just getting better and better. And of course, yeah, Eddie's, Eddie's over there. You're still talking about the remote. Thanks. Appreciate that. So there you go. 
still talking about the remote. Yeah, yeah, I'm still talking about the remote. It's 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 unfortunate, but things like this, um, things like this remote from Roku uh, and 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 software offering are, are are some of the things that that are killing off that that have killed off the Harmony remote altogether. So, yeah, I I'm still talking talking about it, but it, it's uh, Harmony is kind of like, in my my opinion, it's kind of like a uh, a canary, right? And um, I think as as integrators, we kind of need to keep an eye on that because it's if if the harmony goes, then all of the single room solutions go right. Like you don't really need to have a Control Four remote anymore. And then you know at some point you say, well, what is the point of having a Control Four system? <laughs> and then you know things start things start disappearing off the plate for the integrator uh, to to sell and 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 install. Um, so. I know that you get a lot more options out of there than you do out of Roku, but you start mixing in things like HomeKit support. I don't know. It, it, the, all these point devices are, are getting pretty close to what you could do with a basic Control 4 system, um, you know, and and may be better for some people in some cases. So something to keep an eye out on. We'll, we'll, of course, we'll, of course, keep following the Harmony remote, Eddie, just for you. We're going to keep keep on that and uh, keep keep watching what's going on if, if something happens. You'll hear about it here first. <laughs> you know, all the links that we talked about tonight can be found on our show notes at hometech.fm slash 347. Yeah, that's right. Uh, don't forget, you can join us live starting on Wednesdays, starting sometime between 7 and 7.30 p.m. Eastern. You can find out more about that at hometech.fm slash live. Pick of the week. Pick of the week here. And I, I may have to adjust this a little bit. Yeah, I do. Okay, so pick of the week. In our home tech talk, towards the end, I was like, well, I need to go look at the UI website and see what's going on over there. And I I went over there and I scrolled down to the bottom and uh, found this configurator thing that they have. So this is called the UI Designer, I think is what they're calling it. Yeah, Design Center, Unified Design Center. Um, This is wild. (laughs) This is like a, a... for if you, if you do a lot of Unify, this may be something something to check out because um, it, it kind of mirrors a lot of the design tools that I had as a professional integrator and and I continue to have like access to as a, as a distributor for I mean we do like heat maps and stuff for Ruckus all the time we we pay for software to do this with so yeah um, this is something to keep an eye on uh, because it's actually pretty good uh, you you can. It's kind of hard to describe and see in here, but basically you drop in a floor plan into it. You can go in and then basically set up your walls and your dividers. So here I'm going to just draw this, whatever, this long 59 foot divider thing. And, uh, you know, you drop on your access points. Your you They've got all of their products in here, actually. So you can drop in uh, the routing switches, access points, cameras, their access control system that I keep forgetting that they have that looks actually pretty cool. Voice over IP. You can actually run your cables and show them, you know, mark on the plans here where the cable routes are going to go, drop in a rack, uh, put in wall sockets, that kind of thing. It's kind of just a basic design tool. Um, but then what you get out of it, it's actually, you know, it, it's a basic design tool, but also gets you over here to the, the sales tool, right? So like you can actually purchase all of the uh, products if they're in stock the little caveat there. If they're in stock, you can actually, you know, just go in and uh, and buy all the products for there. But what it does do as well is um, there is a, a download. You can export it as a PDF. And let me get back over to that. And the, the PDF will actually have all the, you know, the sales materials on it, like for the heat map and everything on there. And I, I think that is just, it's just a really good looking thing here. So like you've got the floor plan, you've got your heat map. It can show you kind of where the dead spots might be. Uh, you can see on here, uh, like the greenish areas are probably too low for the, this is the 5G coverage. And for 5G, you, you want to have uh, more than 65, negative 65 dB. So, you know, a higher value than that, uh, where you're going to start having problems. And you can see that even with, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six access points here, um, there's a couple spots that you wouldn't expect to be dead. And then you may want to add in another access point or one other wall access points uh, just to get a little bit of uh, extra signal in that area and it may help out. Um, it also does the the surveillance like uh, video surveillance coverage and it does something really cool that um, I used to do on my uh, on my quotes uh, when I was drawing in Visio. <laughs> uh, I would draw these little triangles out and I would extend them out and basically try and show um, what the 
coverage would be for the cameras because cameras are tough. It's it's hard to explain to someone who's not seen a camera. So I, I would actually go out to, to most of the homes I worked on, grab a ladder, grab scaffolding, whatever I needed, and climb up to where the camera would be, take a picture, and basically adjust that picture to the you know the the zoom range it was, and attach it onto something that looked like this, where it had like the effective range of what that camera is going to be, because not all you know you may see. 200 feet with your camera, but the detail is going to get cut off at 40 feet. So kind of, you know, there's, there's ways to visually express that. And I think this does a pretty good job, um, pretty good job of showing that off. Um, and then how, you know, there's walls and stuff that can actually block cameras. <laughs> Amazing. And it just does a pretty good job of that too. And then of course you get a little rack, uh, elevation on here. All in all for a free tool, uh, pretty good, pretty good. I can't, can't complain. Um, I wish something like this existed when I was an integrator for me that, you know, Oh wait, D tools did. <laughs> so yeah, I did a lot of this, the manual, manual and hard way. So, um, I don't know, thought it was pretty cool. Um, thought I'd suggest throwing it out there and see if anybody hadn't seen it, uh, maybe go check it out. Cause uh, I hadn't seen it. And until we had our, um, unify masterclass there in our home tech talks, uh, I, no, I don't think anybody we were on the, you know, that was in the call had heard of it either. So, uh, yeah, check it out. It's pretty cool. If you have any feedback, questions, comments, picks of the week, or great ideas for the show, give us a shout. Email address is feedback at hometech.fm or visit hometech.fm slash feedback and fill out the online form. And with that, I want to give a big thank you to everyone who supports the show, but especially those who are able to financially support the show through our Patreon page. If you don't know about our Patreon page, head on over to hometech.fm slash support to learn how you can support Home Tech for as little as a dollar a month. Any pledge over five bucks a month gets you a big shout out on the show, but every pledge gets you an invite to our private Slack chat, The Hub, and our Home Tech Talks. So check that out. And thank, thank you again, TJ. And uh, t- uh, t- there are two patrons at the top, TJ and Russ, uh, for, for jumping in there. Uh, if you can't help the show financially, totally understand that. I appreciate just a five-star rating in iTunes or a positive rating in a podcast app of your choice. Uh, and with that, I think we're going to wrap it up. Uh, <laughs> looks like everybody's <laughs> everybody's getting in. Greg, Greg says he's late, here, uh, but not pregnant. I'm going to go ahead and add that to the, uh, the, the, the the broadcast there. There you go. And Gavin, thanks very much. Gavin saying good show as usual. Appreciate it. Hey, uh, Greg, there you are. Thanks for swinging by. Made it just in time for me to wrap it up. So appreciate it, guys. Thanks for, uh, thanks for popping into the show here uh, at the end. And, uh, We'll talk to you all next week. Have a good one.